So shall I introduce the speakers or are you? Sorry, I do not see the record. Are you sure you started the recording? Because I, I normally I should get a notification and I didn't. Um, yes. Well, uh, let me. Oh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. Uh, that uh, usually get this notification. Yeah. I got it. Ah, you got it. Okay, you can start. Okay, well, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Bootstrap Seminar. We are very happy today to have Sean Han and Ian who will tell us about uh, Conformal Collider meeting LHC. I guess we have a, a format of 30 plus 30 minutes formally, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes and uh, uh, we'll start. Okay, so. Let me share my screen. Can, can you see see the slides? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So let me start. So first of all, thank thank you very much for this giving me this opportunity to talk. It's a great pleasure. And so today I will talk about conformal colliders meet the OHC. In particular, I will focus on the conformal collider part. And I believe later Ian will tell you more about the OHC part. So um, also this talk is based on a recent paper with David, Davis and Stuffin. You should see also another recent paper by uh, Hao Chen, Ian Mo, Joshua Sandor, and Hua Xingju. I will also mention some results in a previous paper with Murat Kogu, Peter Krabchok, David Simstafin, and Sasha Zibriodo. So the main goal of this talk is to study an observable that's interesting in both CFT and at the OHC. And this observable is the energy correlator. So it's defined as a matrix element of a product of energy detectors the energy detector is, is just um, measuring your total energy flux through uh, along a direction that lives on the D minus two sphere, which I'll call the celestial sphere. So when I say a K point energy correlator, uh, I just mean I have K energy detectors. So these energy correlators are natural observables in conformal or non-conformal collider physics. They measure the energy distribution uh, an infinity on the celestial sphere. For example, this is a two-point energy correlator. So if you measure it in some state psi, it's just uh, you put two energy detectors at infinity and they live on two points on the celestial sphere and they measure the total energy flux that go through these two directions. So, one point energy correlator was studied by Hoffman and Maldacena in this uh, famous paper, Conformal Collider Physics. And for example, for scalar states, it's just a constant. And also they found the, all these interesting uh, conformal collider bounds using the condition that uh, these energy detectors are actually positive, semi-definite. But just from the point of view of calculating one point energy correlator, it's almost completely fixed by symmetry and war identities. So I would say, even in a general CFT, it's pretty well understood how to calculate uh, one point energy correlator. But for a higher point, the situation is different. It just becomes much harder to calculate them in, in a CFT. And um, so there are, for two point energy correlator, or I'll call EEC, uh, there are many results in perturbation theory. For example, at weak coupling, it's known up to three loops in A equals four super young males, and it's known up to two loops in QCD. And Hoffman and Maldacena also argue that you can take kind of OPE between two scalar detect, uh, sorry, between two energy detectors, and the objects that appear in the OPE should be something with spin three. And for a three point energy correlator, or EEEC, uh, it's computed recently at uh, leading order in 
weakly coupled n equals four and QCD. And they also consider the leading behavior in the collinear limit where uh, all three detectors become uh, close to each other. Finally, a strong coupling, uh, actually Hoffman and Madasina were able to calculate general endpoint energy correlator uh, using ADS CFT. Okay, so what I will try to discuss in this talk is that uh, is how to study EEC and EEC just using symmetries. Uh, in other words, I will try to understand how to calculate two point and three point energy correlator in a general CFT. So to do that, I need some better notation for these energy uh, detectors. And this is the light transform. So first of all, I'm using index renotation. So I contract all the indices of an operator with a polarization vector Z. And the light transform is just uh, integrating the operator along a null direction given by this polarization vector. And so I'll call the light transform L, L of O. And it turns out that this L of O is a primary operator with ceiling dimension one minus J and spin one minus delta. And this average null energy operator or energy detector that I discussed earlier is actually just the light transform of a stress sensor. So each energy detector lives on you know, lives at a point on the celestial sphere, and the position is just given by this polarization vector z. Or you can think of this z as the embedding space coordinate on this d minus two sphere. So that means I can actually consider a more general object, which I'll call the two point event shape. So it's a product of two light transform of uh, operator O1, O2 with, some, with two different polarization vector Z and I measure it in some state O with time-like momentum P. So if O1 and O2 are stress sensors, this is the two-point energy correlation, but, uh, but this is uh, something more general I can, I can try to study. So um, let's try to understand how this product transform under the, the Lorentz symmetry. So uh, in this problem, you should really view it as the D minus two dimensional conformal group acting on the celestial sphere. And the reason is because uh, each detector, it's a, you know, it's a point like object on the celestial sphere. And in, in fact, it transforms like a primary operator on the celestial sphere. And you can just work out the dimension of this primary operator. It's given by delta minus one. So the reason is because the dimension is given by homogeneity of Z and the homogeneity of Z here is the spin of the light transform, which is one minus delta. So, it, uh, so you just get this relation. So that means uh, this product uh, under the Lorentz group is just a product of two uh, primary operator. And we all know the P between two primary uh, should look like this. So you have some differential operator fixed by symmetry and you have some new object with new quantum numbers, little duha and little j. So this little j is the, it's the spin on the celestial sphere, and I'll call it the transfer spin. <laughs> so um, just by studying Lorentz symmetry, this two-point event shape should have, we can decompose this two-point event shape into some special functions that's completely fixed by symmetry. Uh, which is this, this object. And then you have some unknown coefficient. So this object that's fixed by symmetry is what we call a two-point celestial blocks. And this is basically given by this uh, two F one function. So this variable uh, zeta uh, is defined here. Basically it tells you the distance between the two detectors. Okay, so, so we have this, this decomposition but we still have some unknown coefficient r that should depend on the dynamics of the theory. So what is the relation? And uh, this question can be answered by studying the full conformal symmetry instead of just the Lorentz symmetry. So if we study the conformal symmetry, we can derive a formula called the Larry OPE. Uh, I don't have time to explain how this is derived, but basically, the object that appears are Larry operators. So Larry operators are um, an analytic continuation of light transform 
of local operators. And uh, more importantly, um, their matrix elements are given by this familiar function, C to J, which is just the in a way continuation of, your, uh, of the OP data. So using this letter OP, we can relate the, this unknown coefficient R on, on the previous slides to, to our local OP data. Um, for example, for this two point event shape, um, so I'm considering scalar states here. That means in this OPE, only j, little j equals zero term will be non vanishing. And so if I plug in this OPE, that OPE, eventually I get a sum over register directories and I have the OPE coefficient analytically continue to j equals minus one. And then I have a function completely fixed by symmetry, which is the two point selection block. But this is for scalar detectors. So these are light transform of scalars. And what we are really interested in is light transform of stress sensors, the, the energy detectors. So the layer OP of energy detectors uh, look like this. Again, each term is a layer operator. So they are related to this C to J. So they naturally live on register directories. And here I plot the register directories for um, uh, for the stress sensor OPE. So each dot is just, uh, you know, each layer operators that, that can appear in this layer OPE. So, so these are even spin trajectories, but you have to evaluate them at odd values of J. And I, I can also ask what, what's the celestial quantum numbers for each term, because for each term, they transform like a primary on this celestial sphere. And the quantum numbers are given by, by this relation. So each little delta, it's related to the scaling dimension on each trajectory trajectory at different values of J. So I'm going to, uh, so I, I will need this relation later in the talk. Let me quickly summarize what uh, I've shown for, for the two point energy correlator. So basically, if we use the orange symmetry, uh, we will see that it can be decomposed into some special functions. Uh, the two point celestial block. And then the conformal symmetry tells us the coefficient of this decomposition is given by the uh, analytic continuation of the OPE data, of your OPE coefficient. And also the quantum numbers are also determined by the layer OPE. So the one sentence summary of this is just um, if we know the analytic continuation of the OPE data, or this is C to J, we can calculate two point energy correlator in any CFT. So now I want to discuss three point. Actually, um, before I do three point, let me pause and see if there's any questions. Hi, yeah, let me try to ask a question. So here, is it clear that this is discrete, this sum after you continue to J equal three or, or you could have a continuum of delta? Is it clear? Is it clear this sum is discrete? Um, so um, I'm, uh, yeah. So if we, I mean, if you read your trajectory looks like this, then I, I think it's discrete. But I'm not sure if I have a general argument. I guess I had this slightly similar question. So in the step one. Sasha, you're probably touching the mic or something. There's oh, a so, sorry. Is it is it okay now or? or yeah. Okay. Uh, so on a, on a previous slide or the, the one, well, the, the, the the last one. Sorry, sorry. The, the, the last one and the part one. Yes, here. So when you do the first step in Lorentz symmetry, wouldn't you write there the integral of a principal series instead of a discrete sum? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. I'm being too sloppy here. Right. So this should really be this. Yeah. Right. And I guess then we, we assume that uh, when we go to j equal three, uh, we just get. Yeah. And, and then we, we deform the contour here when, when we get the C to j in the integral. Right. Other, any other questions? Okay, so let me now talk about three point. 
So uh, you might ask why bother going to three points? Well, one obvious reason is just that there's more kinematic space that we can explore. And I think there are more other reasons for it to collider physics or phenomenology, but I think Ian will explain that better. So, and probably another uh, um, motivation from the CFT side is that I, we have to understand the general structure of the Larry OPE. So if we have a product of three energy detectors, we can OPE two of them, and then we get some Larry operators with another energy detector. But uh, we don't know what this OPE is. So um, I will not try to answer this question in this talk, but, um, but it's, an, it's an important motivation. So for this talk, I'll just study a simpler problem. I would just do the, you know, this, I would just do this first step uh, for the two-point case. Sorry, for, for the three-point case, I'll just do the Lorentz symmetry. And I'll show that we can deco also decompose them into some special function called the three-point selection blocks. So the idea is just almost identical to two-point case. You just view them as primary operators on the celestial sphere. And then you can you know, just do the usual OP. And um, these, so these are, if you OP two of the detectors, you get some quantum rate of Lehold J. And then you OP the third one, you get another quantum number, Leo J prime. So again, I'm assuming the state is a scalar, so there's no transfer spin for this quantum number. And the celestial block just looks like this. These two are familiar differential operator that appears in OPE. And this is coming from taking the matrix element. It's just D3 dot of uh, a timeline momentum P. So um, I don't know if this object has a complex close, close form expression, but there is a limit where this it becomes um, becomes simple, which is the collinear limit. So in collinear limit, we take all three detectors to approach each other. And, and then you can think of it as boosting the momentum P in the opposite direction, and then it becomes almost null. And if P is null, this is just by definition a conformal block. Also, we can actually systematically compute the sublinear terms. Uh, for example, uh, here I show you the first sublinear term. So in this equation, uh, this is just some homogeneity factor. They're not so important. And this is, as I explained, the leading term, which is a d minus two dimensional conformal block. Uh, so these cross ratio u v are defined in this way. So when when you take the collinear limit, so remember these zeta i j are the distance between detector i and detector j. So when you take the collinear limit, all zeta i j become small. So you have two cross ratios, u and v. They are just given by the uh, so the ratio between the two uh, small distances between detectors. And the sublinear term is just some complicated differential operator acting on common block. Okay, so by Lorentz symmetry, um, the EEC should have a conformal block decomposition like this. Um, so this is again, a little bit sloppy. Um, the most correct way is that they, they are integrated along like the, the principal series. But let me just assume for now, I can close the contour. And um, so, uh, so, so this is just the three point slash block that I uh, just discussed. And these again are some uh, unknown coefficient that should depend on the dynamics. And we have to sum over two set of quantum numbers. Uh, the first one is this little delta little j. The second one is little r prime. So this is followed from Lorentz symmetry. So uh, it should be valid in any QFT, but if we have conformal symmetry, uh, we can use this Larry OPE formula. And that tells us what values of little delta should appear in this sum. So this is the result I uh, wrote down earlier in using the Larry OPE of two energy detectors. The values of delta that can appear are just related to the scaling dimension analytically continue to different values of J. So we, we sort of understand this sum, but we don't understand this sum, uh, this little dr prime. We just we just don't know very much about it. 
So we can try to take some limits such that only one term in this sum over the Hodoha prime is important. And this is just the collinear limit where all you know the three detectors or these three angles all become small. And in the limit, in this limit, first of all, the selection block becomes a conformal block, a D minus two dimensional conformal block. And also uh, the Hodoha prime is actually the quantum that controls the scaling in this limits. So you just the leading behavior is just given by the one that has the lowest lowest value. So right, so this factor just gives the scaling behavior in the colonial limit. And we actually have a guess or an expectation for what this, this should be. And the reason is because there's a spin selection rule. So if we consider a product of three energy detectors, we got some, some object that we don't know what it is, but uh, what we can actually fix the quantum numbers by symmetry. So if we consider the location symmetry, uh, this object actually should have spin four. So we expect this to be something with spin four. And also we expect this to be related to the OP data. So there's just one natural candidate. It's just a spin four operator in the OP. And uh, so the expectation is that this value uh, to our prime is given by the scaling dimension of the deleting twist spin four operator. Uh, we don't have a rigorous argument, but we will see that this is true in two examples later. So the, the two examples are n equals four weak and strong coupling. In fact, uh, one can also see this from uh, real LHC data. And I believe Ian will talk more about this later. Sorry, can, can I ask a question about this? Because yes. before you had spin three, but it was not physical operators with spin three was operators like the rest trajectory of even operators. Yes. But now you're saying that you expect really a spin four local operator. Why not the continuation of an odd trajectory? To uh, that's right. Um, I think it's just because you do have a spin four operator in the OPE. Unlike previously, awesome. if we have spin three, then we don't have anything. We just have an LA continuation. So yeah, I don't have rigorous argument. Just, just, just as But why, why like odd spin operators couldn't contribute and then their continuation would appear here at spin four? Right, it's possible. So you mean like our spin trajectories and then we evaluate that J equals four. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's possible, but yeah. Right. So, yeah, I I think it, it's also possible. Okay. So sorry, isn't isn't it the star T plus? Like if right. you on, with CRT on both sides of your equation. Ah, right, right, right. So, okay, thanks. Thanks, for, okay. Right, so there's another symmetry or maybe not a symmetry. There, there's, there's a map on operators. It's, it's uh, CRT plus uh, Hermitian conjugate. So plus Hermitian conjugate. So under this map, a large transform of operator with spin J will have a signature minus one to the J like this. So you can ask, okay, what's the signature of this product under this map is just one, right? So uh, this thing should also have um, signature one, but if this thing lives on an even, sorry, an odd spin trajectory, then, then it has signature minus one. So, um, okay, thank right, you. Right, so this, this thing should also, Right, so because of this, this thing should, should have uh, even signature, so it should live on the even spin trajectory, and it has spin four, and so, right, so, yeah. Thank you, perfect. Yeah, thanks for reminding me, Sasha. Right, okay, so let's now look at some examples of three-point energy correlator. The first example is, um, at weak coupling. So uh, it's computed uh, 
in this paper. And actually they, they consider the leading behavior in the collinear limit. So, uh, so it should have this expansion. And, and this is their result. And one thing you immediately notice is that the result is independent of this overall scaling. So uh, that means uh, this little dr prime star should be five, which is consistent with our expectation because uh, you know the leading twist spin four operator in here is just at dimension six, which is so it, it's just just consistent. And um, but there's a lot more we can say because other than just scaling behavior, because we have this all these very non-trivial dependence on the on this U and V, which are ratio between the small angles in the colonial limit. So th this function should have a decomposition into conformal blocks. So we can try to use the Lorentzian inversion formula to calculate the coefficient of the conformal block expansion. But to use the Lorentzian inversion formula, we have to first analytically continue the Lorentzian signature on the celestial sphere, because this is a four-point function on the celestial sphere. And it's not clear why we can do that non-perturbatively, uh, simply because there's just no theory live on the D minus two sphere. Our theory is, a, is, is the D-dimensional theory. But, uh, but this is just a very explicit expression, so we, nothing prevents us from analytically continue this expression. And indeed, we, we see that it has just, it, it just have, we can make sense of it even in Lorentz's signature, even when Z and Z bar are you know, real independent variables. And perhaps more surprisingly, uh, it's actually very well behaved in the celestial regio limit. So by celestial regio limit, I mean, I just mean you continue Z and Z bar in the way that you usually do to go to regio limit. And it has intercept um, minus two. So it's really very well behaved. Because of this, the Lorentzian inversion formula just works very well. Uh, for example, this is the coefficient for the uh, sort of the leading celestial twist uh, conformal blocks. Um, maybe I should speed up. Oh, I should really speed up. Sorry. Uh, so another example is uh, uh, a strong coupling. So a strong coupling. Um, we, we have an expression that works not just in the colonial limit, it works for any generic, generic detector positions. And so because of this, we can study the complete celestial block expansion instead of just conformal block expansion using a celestial inversion formula, which basically follows from harmonic analysis of the Lorentz group. And the formula looks like this. You have some function whose residues give the coefficient of celestial block expansion and in the right-hand side, uh, we, it's just an integral of the three-point energy collider against some celestial partial wave. Okay, so using this formula, and we can just plug in this and find the find a celestial block expansion. So for a leading order, the result is this. So I want to focus on the quantum numbers. So the quantum numbers of little, the little delta quantum number is uh, six plus two n, and you can check that these correspond to double traces in this double stress sensor OPE and then we'll click continue to J equals three. There's another quantum number, Leo R prime. Um, and we can we find that it's just perfectly agree with quantum numbers of triple traces in the stress sensor OPE at J equals four. Okay. So these quantum numbers are probably not so surprising because um, from Larry OPE, we know they, they have to be this. But these quantum numbers are like, uh, we don't know much about Dilhaub prime, but it seems like it agrees with our you know, expectation. Okay. So finally, let me talk about a crossing equation satisfied this by two point energy correlator. So the idea is very simple. You take the OP in a different order and you get the crossing equation. So here I consider a three point event shape where this O has been J O. And also for simplicity, I just consider the collinear limit of this crossing equation, and I, and I got this, this equation. So this is a, just a D minus two dimensional conformal block. One of the external dimension is given by the leading twist operator with this value of spin. So again, this comes from the spin selection rule. So 
this looks like a D minus two dimension. Sorry, this looks like a usual four point crossing equation in the D minus two dimension of CMT. <clears throat> but the meaning of the exchange quantum number is very different. There are quantum numbers that appear in the Larry OPE. They are not quantum numbers of any local operators. And also the coefficient um, R, as far as I know, do not satisfy any positivity condition. So the usual numerical bootstrap methods do not work, at least in an obvious way. Um, so here I'll just do a very simple Lycombe bootstrap analysis and see what we can learn from this crossing equation. So if we take this double Lycombe limit, uh, there, are, you know, there are two terms that can appear on the left hand side. And to reproduce these two terms, I will have to have uh, two infinite families of operator, one with these value of h and the other one with this value of h. So I'm switching to h and h bar here. So these are- Sorry, sorry, sorry how, how much time do you, do you still need, you think? Is it, uh, I think I need like five minutes. <laughs> Is that okay? Or, I, okay, let's, let, let's try to, to do it. Okay, I'll five. try to okay. try to speed up. And I think this, I mean, I'll talk about future directions in the next time. Okay. So, um, right, so, so, so these are the quantum numbers that start on the celestial sphere, but using Larry OP, we can relate that to, you know, to our OP data. And the appearance of these two infinite families of operators just predicts two types of radio trajectories that should appear. And the first one has transfer spin two times JO with spin two times two IO at large spin. Sorry, with twist two times two IO at large spin. And the second trajectory has the same transfer spin but with a different value of twist and large spin. Okay, so let me quickly talk about some future directions. And one important direction, or for me, is probably the most important is that we have to understand this more general Larry OPE. Or another way of saying it is that we have to use, consider full conformal symmetry and try to relate this R to the OPE data. And there are many examples from either from symmetry or from derivative data that suggests this R should be related to uh, this triple stress tensor OP at J equals four, but we don't have any rigorous argument for that. Okay, and, and there are some other interesting direction. For example, I showed that using an early continuation of the OP data, we can calculate any, uh, we can calculate two point energy correlator in any CFT. So it might be also interesting to calculate them in some, non perturbed CFT such as 3D Ising and O1 model. And if these CFT have quantum critical points, uh, for example, the O2 model, we can maybe try to measure them in the lab. But I have no idea how hard this is ex experimentally. And when we consider this collinear EEC, we, we found that the Lorentz and Regen phenomenon works very well, but there, there's no reason why it should work. So does it still work at high order or non perturbedly and also, what's the meaning of this weird special regular limit? The, finally, I, I study also study a crossing equations from the three point celestial block expansion, but I only study a very, very tiny corner of the kinematic, kinematic space because I first take the collinear limit and then I take double Lycombe limit. So there's really a lot of other kinematic configuration that one can study uh, for this crossing. And I believe there are many more applications of future direction one can study at the OHC. And for that, I think we should all listen to Ian's talk. So I will stop here and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I suggest that we go straight to Ian in, in case uh, some, some of us need has some commitment sharp at seven, but then we will come back and have a discussion after the talk, for the discussion. Okay, so I guess Ian, um, just go ahead. Perfect. So can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. So thanks a lot for the invitation to speak. It's very fun um, to come to this seminar. So I'm going to do the second part of this talk. And so since Swan Han very nicely covered the kind of conformal colliders aspect, I'm going to focus a bit more on the um, meet the LHC part and try and make this um, very explicit in LHC data. And so this is based 
I mean, it'll be based on a number of things, but on this recent paper with Hao Chen, uh, Joshua Sandor, and Hua Jingzhu, as well as more generally on a whole bunch of work with, in particular, Hao Chen and Hua Jingzhu on trying to make um, this connection between these nice conformal collider ideas that many people here have been studying and um, the real world. And so since I think this audience is um, very much more on the conformal collider side, I wanted to just kind of very basically introduce the LHC and kind of what exactly we're doing when we're measuring these, just to make sure everyone is kind of uh, on the same page. Um, okay, so just as a very nice um, starting picture of what you get when you collide things at the LHC. So you get out these very complicated sprays with kind of hadrons going in all directions. And so the classic way that people analyze these was to look at these jets, which are just kind of these cones, which can be thought of as some kind of blob of energy going in some uh, particular direction. And so these are things for which, I mean, there's been a huge amount of progress, for example, in computing scattering amplitudes, which allows one to compute um, many, many jet cross sections um, at the LHC now. And so in the last number of years, there's been a push both experimentally and on the kind of phenomenological side to transition a bit from measuring these jet cross sections to actually trying to measure the distribution of energy inside jets. And so since Suan Han uh, very nicely discussed this three-point correlator, one example of something you could measure inside a jet is this three-point correlation of energy um, kind of deposited in your detector at infinity. And of course, as he emphasized, one of the reasons why this is useful is this is literally what the experimentalist off at infinity will actually measure in the detector. And so you could ask why um, people are so interested in this. And this kind of goes under this name of what is called jet substructure. So looking at the internal substructure of flow of energy within a jet. And so the reason why this became experimentally very popular is that if you're just looking at the kind of energy deposits of hadrons at infinity, which is all experimentalists can do, then the only way you have a handle of what's going on, so for example, if you produce some kind of new physics thing or whatever inside here, which then just decays, the only way that you ever know that you produce it is that you have some modification of your energy pattern, which can be detected, for example, with this three-point correlator. And so beyond these kind of searches, there's a lot of just interesting opportunities to study QCD at high energy or to measure parameters of the standard model. So for example, the coupling constant, or as I'll very briefly mentioned, you can do things like produce um, very heavy top quarks, which then decay into these correlators and you can detect that they exist and then extract their properties by measuring the structure of these correlators. So um, just for the same reasons that people were interested in these in the conformal collider context, these are the kind of observables that you actually literally measure in your detector and that characterize the energy flow. And so there's been a lot of progress in trying to um, better understand how to measure more detailed um, energy flow in colliders. Um, and so why is this relevant for this particular um, seminar? So one of the reasons why this is particularly well suited to um, the approaches that were just discussed, in particular light ray OPE, is that at the LHC, you're not interested in, or for the most part, because the events are extremely complicated, you're not interested in kind of configurations where the light rays are at completely generic configurations, but instead you're interested in cases where they're all kind of very collimated within a single high energy jet. And so this is ideally suited um, to be studied using the light ray OPE because you're essentially already forced yourself into the limit about which the um, light ray OPE is expanding. And so for example, if you just consider this two point um, OPE shown here, which is just an expansion in the twists for phenomenological applications to get the leading scaling behavior, this is very convenient because you essentially only need the leading twist behavior. And so this kind of expansion is naturally an expansion about the limit, which is now of current interest. Um, and so in some sense, this jet substructure is kind of a phenomenological realization of the OPE limit of light ray operators. And so it's very natural um, to try and um, measure these correlators and use techniques developed in particular this light ray OPE to um, go over to the LHC. And so 
for people with a CFT background, this may be surprising, but for some reason, which I'll discuss very briefly, um, this was never the approach that was taken to um, studying jets. And so there's this, after this Maldacena Hoffman paper, there's this kind of discussion here at KTP saying, I mean, there's plenty of QCD data. Why don't people, or why don't you just go um, look at it and see if you can see all these nice predictions, for example, of the light ray OPE. And so his response was kind of, people don't do this. I haven't figured out why they don't. And so I should say, of course, there were um, exceptions um, even early on and then kind of restarting again in about 2013. But for the most part, this was kind of completely ignored by the, um, let's say more phenomenological or LHC um, side of things. And so as a result, none of these correlators have ever actually been measured at the LHC. And to my knowledge, no multi-point correlators have actually ever been measured. Um, and so this is kind of, um, there's this kind of very beautiful story on the theory land. And then there's this big divide with how people actually talk about jets and jet substructure at the LHC. And so I'm not, I don't want to get into the kind of history of why there's this divide, but I just kind of want to briefly touch upon two of the kind of reasons, um, just so people can understand a little bit. So the first reason is just a purely sociological reason that originally what people were interested in doing is studying kind of the shapes of jets. So essentially how kind of wide a jet is um, kind of like this. And so the reason was that these were invented very early on when people wanted to use jets as essentially resolution variables for your underlying S matrix element. So for example, this is supposed to mimic some infrared safe version of a kind of QQ bar pair being produced. And then you could do this also, for example, to discover the gluon. And then you can study the kind of angular distributions of these jets. And so people kind of um, really focused in on these so-called jet shapes and then never kind of rethought what they were doing. And these jet shapes are not correlation functions. This is kind of a very different class of observable. And for some reason, this is just the way that people have studied jets ever since this kind of original introduction in 1977 or so. And so the second reason is actually a more kind of practical reason is that um, QCD is not a conformal uh, theory. And so in particular, while you have this at high energies, you have this regime where you have um, quarks and gluons and you can calculate things perturbatively and use all these nice light ray LPE tricks. You also have um, hadronization that you have to contend with. And so at the energy scales of the previous colliders, which were in particular LEP, where these things could be done in a very clean way, there were a number of problems to trying to measure these two-point correlators. And so the two-point correlator was in fact um, tried there. And so the first is that you have a large, because it's a very low energies, you have large corrections to the structure of energy flow coming from this hadronization. And so this is just a, a simulation at the um, energies of LEP where it shows the result both on something just doing partons, so just quarks and gluons, and then including the effect of hadronization. And so you can see in this small angle region, which is of interest to the light ray OPE, there's kind of a huge order one um, discrepancy between what you get on hadrons and what you get on um, a calculation in terms of quarks and gluons. And so the other problem is if you wanted to go beyond, let's say a two point correlator to measure this um, three point correlator that was discussed, if you kind of look at how many particles are actually in your jets at these energies, you typically only have four or five particles. And so what this is saying is that the finite masses of the particles coming out actually play a big role at these energies. And so you can only get kind of four or five particles. And so therefore, if you're trying to measure a four or five point correlator, it's not gonna behave um, very well, or it's not gonna behave at all like it does in um, perturbation theory. And so because of this, these two point correlators were kind of tested um, very early on and then just kind of abandoned to um, history. And so this problem is kind of, once you understand how to deal with the complexities of the LHC is kind of completely overcome by these extremely high energy collisions. So in particular, you can easily make kind of TEV scale jets with extremely high multiplicity. So you can see there's very, very many particles uh, coming out here. And so you can measure in principle um, very high point correlators 
and they behave um, or you're in a perturbative regime where you can really do um, first principles calculations in terms of uh, quarks and gluons. And second, you also have extremely good detectors. And so you can actually measure the kind of angular resolution uh, extremely well and measure these multi-point correlations um, with no uh, problems. And so with that as the kind of motivation for the general picture, now I just want to go through how one can look for some of these properties that were discussed uh, in the previous talk in LHC data. And so this will be primarily kind of like a picture version of all the different features that were uh, discussed in the previous talk. Um, so the most basic thing is just this scaling behavior, which is predicted by the light ray OPE. So as you move them together, it essentially predicts a scaling just with the anomalous dimension of these leading twists, these twist two spin J operators. Um, and so just as a very brief thing to show the kind of uh, general notation. So here we're gonna measure jets inside, or we're gonna measure these correlators inside very high energy jets at the LHC. And so in Swan Han's talk, there was always this um, cross ratio zeta ij. And so in the collider context, it's more common to use a variable, it's called r. And so this has to be done um, for boost invariance, which is shown here, but it's small angles. This is essentially, you just have this relation between this cross ratio and um, this r, which is used. And so you should just think of this r in the plots that are coming up as the cross ratio itself and just, forget any um, additional details. And so the second thing which I should um, say is, so I won't discuss, or so I think, I can't remember if this was mentioned in the previous talk, but so essentially what this is doing is measuring these correlators in highly boosted quark or gluon states. So this was this collinear limit. And so I won't discuss how one actually computes the kind of light ray densities in which you measure these states, but this is something which can be done at the LHC using um, QCD factorization theorems. And so we can essentially compute perturbatively the state in which these will be measured. And then you just um, take the expectation value in that state. And I'll kind of gloss over exactly um, how that was done, but one can just hopefully trust that it can be done. Um, okay, so specializing what was done in the previous talk to the case of QCD. So at weak coupling in QCD, there are um, two twist two operators, which are characterized by a transverse or a spin and a transverse spin. And so these are just the kind of very standard operators. So you have one for quarks and one for gluons. And so, and then you also have a transverse spin two operator, which is purely uh, gluonic. And so doing this light transform, this gives you the kind of complete set of leading twist operators which will determine the scaling behavior of all these, uh, uh, or which you will get in the iterated light ray OPE at leading twists. And so I'll come back to the case of this, um, these polarized, or, or we call them polarized, but these transverse spin two operators later. But so at the LHC, you, um, if you just measure the scaling behavior of kind of jets, because you don't have a polarized source, you don't um, excite these operators or you just average over them. And so we'll be able to excite them later inside higher point correlators. But to begin with, to just study the scaling properties, one is just sensitive to these um, quark and gluon leading twist two operators. And so the anomalous dimensions of these operators, which are then um, given here, completely determine the leading behavior of these uh, correlators at the LHC, which is extremely nice. And so I should just say, again, I won't go into much detail, but instead of just a power law, you actually need this renormalization group equation to take into account the running coupling and kind of whether this or the effects that this have depend on how big this running coupling or the beta function is compared to the anomalous dimension. Um, but for most of the things that I show later, you'll see that it, do, it doesn't have a, that big of an effect as compared to what you would expect on the CFT side. But it I'll kind of again gloss over it, but it can be, or it is um, incorporated in everything I show. Okay, so the first thing one can uh, do is to actually just measure this most basic object is this two point correlator of light ray operators um, shown here. And so this is inside um, 500 GeV jets at the LHC and is um, with Kyle Lee and Bianca McCash building on our earlier um, factorization theorems. And you can see um, 
first of all, this analytic calculation um, shown in this um, red line compared with real um, data shown in black. And so you can see that this is extremely nice kind of agreement. And so this OPE seems to be working um, very nicely. And again, from the uh, kind of phenomenological side, the thing that's really nice is that this kind of um, universality in the small angle limit really allows us to do these calculations in this very complex LHC environment. So you really have all this kind of stuff going on, but if you really focus in on these small angles, you really get this kind of beautiful agreement between the um, um, prediction from the OPE and the perturbative calculation. And there's been no kind of fudging or anything to take into account extra things. It's really just coming from this universality and the small angle limit. Um, okay, so Swan Han also showed this nice um, picture that as you go to higher point correlators, um, the scaling is just probed by higher spin um, operators in your theory. And so in particular here, we're just gonna be able to probe essentially this leading scaling behavior, which is this leading uh, Reggie trajectory. And so, as I mentioned, as you go up in the number of points, you're just probing the higher um, spin or higher J uh, operators. So for example, if you do the five point correlator, you're probing the um, twist two spin six operators. And so one thing which I'll do when I show the data for these higher point uh, correlators is to isolate this anomalous scaling as well as to remove certain um, non-perturbative effects, it's useful to always normalize them uh, to the two-point correlator. So I'll show the scaling, for example, of a five-point correlator, but it'll be normalized to the two-point. And so essentially what you get is just an expectation of this higher point correlator over um, the twist two spin three um, operators. And so this just kind of removes the classical scaling behavior. So you're just focusing on the um, kind of quantum or the anomalous dimension part of the scaling. And so because you have actually so much data at the LHC, you can actually just measure these to extremely high points. So for example, this is going all the way up to the 10 point correlator showing here, shown here, which I think is, is kind of neat that you can actually do this. And so again, this is this ratio plotted here of the um, end point correlator to the two point correlator. And so you can see in this perturbative regime in the middle, this kind of very nice scaling uh, behavior um, shown here. And so you can really kind of probe the like, yeah, the anomalous dimensions of these light ray operators. And so by eye in this plot, which is shown here, you can see, for example, very basic features like the convexity of this um, Reggie trajectory, namely the fact that the anomalous dimensions of these higher spin operators are larger. So as you, increase the number of points in your correlator, you get a steeper and steeper uh, slope in this region. And so I think it's kind of quite neat that one can actually um, really probe these anomalous scalings for very high point correlators easily. And I'll come back a little bit later to what's happening in these regions, which have been shaded out, but they're essentially when you either go outside of the jet and then you um, kind of hit the essentially the boundary or when you enter the non-perturbative uh, region down here. And so just like the um, earlier case, one can actually perform analytic calculations. So this is for these the three all the way up to the six point. And so one gets quite good agreement um, for these anomalous scaling. So it's really kind of shown that you're actually probing these um, anomalous dimensions of these higher point correlators. And so I should say this is, well, so first from the jet substructure perspective, this is quite nice because these are the first calculations of substructure observables at this accuracy by kind of exploiting the simplicity of this um, light ray OPE. And also that both the data and the calculations for these will be kind of much improved. So these are kind of our own analyses of the data. And so I think things will get uh, much better, but already you can see that again, um, things are looking kind of very good and you really get this um, increased scaling as you go to higher points. And so it's quite neat that you get this kind of very actually quantitative agreement between the anomalous dimensions of these operators and what you really see inside high energy jets. Sorry, Ian, uh, just a very yeah. quick question. Uh, what are the sources in, in this correlation function? Maybe yeah, you so, did this before, can you say that again? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I skipped a little bit over these, but these are essentially, so in this case, what one is taking is you can view it as an extremely boosted um, quark state. So it's essentially a quark state, um, Oops. essentially a quark field tied off by a Wilson line, um, which is going or kind of pointing in the opposite direction to the jet. So you can think of 
when this um, correlator in here is extremely boosted, everything here kind of goes into the backwards direction and can be represented by a, a Wilson line object. And so then you just evaluate the correlators in this um, uh, state for quark and then there's a similar, um, just like adjoint Wilson line for gluon. Um, and so there's a, a kind of a rigorous factorization theorem for how to um, produce these that takes into account all the initial state and stuff, but that I've kind of swept under the rug and you essentially then just evaluate these correlators in uh, this state produced by these highly boosted quarks or gluons. I see, I see, thank you. Um, okay, and so that's the kind of most basic thing, which is just this um, scaling behavior. But obviously what one wants to do is kind of go towards these more fun uh, multi-point correlators, which were um, nicely discussed in the last talk. And so, as was said, the um, first non or correlator with non-trivial shape is the three-point correlator shown here. And so it's characterized by a single complex variable um, Z for the shape. And so the very nice thing is one can actually just measure this explicitly um, in data. And so to be able to bin things, it's a bit inconvenient. So normally this variable Z would live in some kind of curved uh, region shown here. Um, but it's very, that's very inconvenient for experimental analyses. And so one kind of blows up this region into a square by using a, essentially a radial coordinate away from the OPE limit and a angular or azimuthal coordinate about the OPE limit. So it essentially blows the OPE limit up into a line. And so in this plot, here is the kind of OPE limit uh, down here. You have an equilateral triangle up here, and then you have these kind of flattened uh, triangles up here. And so it, it's a bit hard to visualize if one hasn't thought about it, um, but the kind of cool thing is you can really actually measure these and they exhibit some kind of shape, which can be compared with our um, analytic calculations. Um, and it, um, I think it's, it's quite neat. You can really measure these higher point correlators that are really living on the celestial sphere or in the LHC case, the detector. And so just for fun, we made kind of a video. So these thing is a function of the, so this is the shape dependence, but it's a function of the scale. And so you can just um, kind of play this as a function of scale. And at some point you just explicitly see the hadronization transition. And once you have, so once when you have quarks and gluons, you have these kind of intricate or the shape of the three point correlator, and then you hit the hadronization scale and then they're just uncorrelated hadrons. And this becomes just a uniform distribution. And so you can kind of watch the hadronization um, erase the structure of the three-point correlator by I, which is kind of um, amusing. And so just one more thing, which one can um, explicitly kind of play with in data. So from Swan Han's talk, he showed how you could decompose these into um, celestial blocks indexed by the celestial dimension and the transverse spin. And so just a, a kind of a fun question is just how well does this work? And can you just kind of look at the um, convergence of this? And so it's quite hard in these um, 2D plots, but you can take slices, um, for example, through these um, pieces here. And so this is just a slice um, in at a fixed value here as a function of the angle. And you can see the full calculation up here and then the kind of block expansion um, in blue. And so this is at twist two and then at twist four uh, shown here. And so you can see that this thing actually kind of converges very nicely. And so these celestial blocks are kind of very nicely describing the shape as they should, but it's just kind of fun to see this um, actually play out. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'll just very briefly kind of highlight two applications of this, and then I'll, I'll uh, move quickly just for time. So one thing which I didn't discuss before was these transverse spin um, J equals two operators, which appear at weak coupling at leading twist. And so these are excited in the squeezed limit of the three-point correlator as you rotate um, two correlators about each other. And so you can actually use these to validate certain simulations which are used at the LHC. And so this is, for example, our um, calculation shown here compared or with a simulation which was kind of tuned to this to verify it. And you can see that this kind of um, agrees very nicely. And then these simulations can be used more broadly in kind of searches um, at the LHC. Um, 
And then the second application of this three-point correlator, which again, I can't really do any justice to in um, one slide, is so before I show these kind of very nice uh, scaling behaviors, if you have massless quarks and gluons, but of course, at the, in the standard model, you can stick in some massless massive state. So for example, a top quark. And then this breaks this um, scaling symmetry and it essentially imprints itself at a particular angular scale into your detector. And so you can just work out uh, what that is um, shown here. And so this is actually very useful because it essentially probes the mass of the top quark. And so this is a kind of plot in simulation for different values of the top quark mass shown here. And you can see that you get a very good sensitivity to the value of the top quark mass. And so you can, for instance, measure this using these um, correlators, which you can compute uh, very nicely. Um, um, okay, and so I have just two more things that I wanted to go through uh, very briefly. So the first is this um, hadronization transition. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, real world QCD is a bit more complicated or it's not as uh, conformal field theory. And so earlier I showed these quantitative uh, comparisons in this region where you have perturbative quarks and gluons and you can really do first principles calculations. But you expect if you measure this correlation function that you should really see two qualitatively different regimes. One where you're seeing the scaling behavior associated with the light ray OPE. And then you should see some kind of particular scale where confinement sets in. And then you expect to just see freely propagating, uniformly distributed hadrons uh, at um, very small angular scales propagating out into your detector. And so if you measure this, this is exactly what you see. And so before I was focusing just on this um, region here, um, where you get this nice scaling behavior of quarks and gluons, but then you hit this um, kind of transition scale where you kind of see by eye confinement um, happen. And then you really just see a perfect scaling associated with um, uniformly distributed hadrons. And so this is the reason why it's not flat, um, as in um, um, the kind of Maldacena Hoffman is just because you have some prefactored or essentially Jacobian by switching variables, but this corresponds to just uniformly distributed um, hadrons at very small scales. And that's just because the hadrons are no longer interacting, they're just kind of freely floating off into your detector. And so you can kind of really measure at extremely small angles and see kind of very nicely the structure of um, QCD. And so if you didn't know beforehand, you could see that it um, had some abrupt transition uh, appearing here. And so very briefly, I just also wanted to, so this was nicely uh, described in the previous talk, but I just want to um, kind of say a very small amount about the kind of perturbative structure of these correlators and where I think it's kind of interesting to have some interplay between um, the light ray OPE perspective and um, perturbative calculations using more standard um, loop techniques. Um, so although I showed the experimental results um, for these earlier and Swan Han discussed the light ray or the Lorentzian inversion of the um, kind of perturbative result we have, I just wanted to very briefly say why these things are kind of simple to calculate and how we did it. Um, and so to compute these in perturbation theory, so in perturbation theory at leading order, you just have some, for example, three particles coming out into your detector. And so the action of the light ray operator is just to essentially weight by the energy, which I'll call the energy fractions, omega one, omega two, and omega three. And then you just integrate over all possible energies but keeping the shape or the angles between these detectors fixed. And so essentially what you get schematically is some integral shown here over the momentum fractions. And so they just by energy conservation have to add up to one. You then weight by the energies and then you have some object called a splitting function, which describes, for example, the splitting of a quark or gluon into uh, three quarks or gluons. And you can just for a kind of toy um, example, Assume that, for example, the splitting function is just one over S123, where S123 is the Mandel stem for the three particles. And so if you look at the integral that you get, you get something of this form uh, shown here. And so it's just some integral of some rational function in these um, omega variables, where now these angles are the Z12, Z1213, and Z23. And so one thing you immediately recognize if after looking at this is that this is just a standard Feynman parameter integral, 
where you interpret the energy fractions uh, shown here as the Feynman parameters and the um, Zij are the kind of dual or what are referred to as dual coordinates um, for the momenta. So if you just do the loop integral, you could write it exactly in this way. And so what this allows one to do is essentially take the energy correlator or this three point energy correlator and map it to very well known, um, in this case, one loop integrals. And so for example, you get this um, three mass triangle integral shown here. And so the structure and the functions appearing in these integrals is very well understood. And so that's how we were kind of quite easily able to get this um, result, which was discussed earlier. And so in particular, from the um, perturbative perspective, what appears in here are fairly standard um, integrals. So for example, just the Bloch-Wigner um, dilogarithm. And so this gives us a kind of um, perturbative uh, or loop amplitude style uh, understanding of the functions which appear and the kind of structure of the functions which appear in this result. And so then when you look at this with the light ray OPE, the thing that's kind of interesting, at least to me, is this kind of gives a completely different uh, perspective on how one should think about the amplitude. And so in perturbation theory, um, these um, general, for example, crossing pictures, which Swanhan showed, actually have a very transparent interpretation. And so in general, these energy correlators sum over all um, partonic states. But of course, in perturbation theory, you can just look at particular diagrams. And so, for example, I could take this uh, diagram here, where this gluon splits into two uh, quarks shown here, and I can squeeze these two um, energy operators here. And so when you do that, you squeeze onto a physical state, namely you just have a gluon entering there. And so you know that it just has to have transverse spin um, j equals zero or two. And so the kind of remarkable thing is if you decompose just this um, piece of the amplitude, you really see that you just have these um, blocks where you always have um, j equals zero or two. And so this is not at all obvious to me, um, at least from this perturbative result written in terms of these um, poly logarithms um, and stuff shown up here. And so it gives kind of a very different uh, perspective. And I think it'd be interesting to better understand this interplay between the kind of function space, um, which are quite well known from the studies of amplitudes and this light ray OPE, which places very non-trivial um, constraints. And so again, as was mentioned in these crossing equations, so if you fixate on this one particular um, diagram here, you don't get this analyticity and spin, you just get these two particular um, spin transverse spins um, appearing. But of course, when you actually measure the energy correlator, you have to sum over all states. And so this other kind of cross channel We'll, we'll now have to reproduce this singularity from the perturbative gluon using an infinite sum over states. And so somehow this um, is made or is not at all manifest in this, um, these kind of polylogarithmic functions, but there should be some way of, um, or it constrains it, and it would be very interesting to better understand um, how that works. Okay, and so sorry if I've gone a bit over time, but just to summarize, so hopefully I kind of illustrated to you that this jet substructure, which is something which is quite popular at the LHC, really provides essentially a physical realization of the OPE limit of these light ray operators. And so the techniques that people or many people in the audience have been developing really can be directly applied to actual measurements at the LHC. And so the shapes and scalings of these correlators can all be nicely measured. And they really um, agree with all the expectations uh, kind of beautifully, which is uh, quite spectacular to see. And I think this kind of opens the door to many more uh, studies at the LHC using um, the very nice measurements in jet substructure and all these um, light ray OPE techniques. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, and uh, now we, we can open the floor for discussion and questions. Is okay. Maybe, 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 maybe I can start. So, um, can, can you say a little bit? So, do you think that using this te technology of energy correlators, there can be actually more information can be extracted from the known data already, or so? Is there advantage of using this technology in terms of searching for new physics and? Yeah, so I think it depends if you mean for searching for new physics or for learning about um, 
standard model um, stuff. So, so one of the differences, so if I go back to the very beginning, um, so if you really want to use it, so one of the reasons why these observables were less studied at the beginning is that there, if you have like a particular jet, you don't get a, a specific value. So um, people often, like if you measure, people measure like the mass of a jet. And so there you have like, if you have one event, you really get one value and then you can put some like, does this look like my new physics model? And so the difference with these is you really do it as an ensemble average and kind of build up the distribution over time. And so this makes it a bit harder for very rare new physics searches. In principle, you could measure the distribution and look for bumps, but probably this is not the most efficient way to do things. And so I think where these really help is for learning or precision standard model measurements, like for example, measuring the top quark mass, which is something that's been very hard to do by other techniques because you can't really have a full field theoretic setup. But here you can, it's kind of the simplest or it's a very simple observable. And there you just, it's fine if you measure it as an ensemble average and then you just study the properties. Um, and same for example, for kind of probing uh, QCD. And so I think one can definitely go back in some sense, the things that were um, measured before in QCD are all kind of very primitive. So there are most things that probe kind of two particle interactions. Whereas that now one can measure these three point correlators. I think there's a huge um, amount to learn. And there's actually people that develop the parton shower um, simulations um, for the LHC. So one of the things that they've been trying to implement to improve searches for beyond the standard model physics is to directly include these one to three splitting functions into the simulations. But one of the difficulties for them is that they couldn't test any of this before because none of the observables that people could calculate actually probe this behavior. And so now you can actually measure these higher point uh, correlators and you can measure these scaling behaviors of just all the different operators. And so I think this gives a kind of huge amount um, for these precision measurements that you couldn't do before. Um, and that may, I think, I think it will not go into beyond the standard model physics kind of directly, but it will um, improve these simulations, which then are used for all the searches. Um, and one thing I should just, or just, yeah, one more comment uh, is that a lot of these searches for new physics use things like machine learning, which are looking for these correlations, like spin correlations in some way within the jets. And so the problem is that the simulations don't include them. And then you can't, or the kind of whatever you want to use to search for new things can't exploit it. But once you understand how to do this and then it can be implemented in simulations, then people can exploit these um, to look for new physics. So I think it's kind of like a, a two-step process to get to um, um, beyond the standard model search applications. Um, Thank you. Other questions? I would like to ask a follow-up question. I mean, <clears throat> can you use this technique, for instance, to identify <clears throat> the structure of a jet to distinguish between a quark jet and a gluon jet and uh, get some other information? Uh, in particular, I think that would be very interesting to, to understand what, what can you extract about the adronization process when things become uh, uh, well, uh, well, more interesting, I believe, but uh, uh, less related to this uh, uh, this approach that you you discussed. Yeah. So, so absolutely. So, I think one of the other difficulties with previous measurements is they they're not kind of correlators, and so they don't identify particular scales. And so, I think so. I've in this talk mostly focused on this perturbative region, but even though I, one doesn't understand what's happening uh, in this transition region, um, it can be measured experimentally um, and you can do it on, for example, enriched samples of quarks and gluons, and it provides very interesting probes of the hadronization process um, in a way that was not possible before. And so I think absolutely that's extremely um, interesting. And I think you can also do that, for instance, in um, heavy ion um, collisions 
um, where you understand even less, but you're also interested mm -hmm. in how the hadronization process is um, modified. And so I think, yeah, absolutely the kind of precision measurements of these, even in regions where you don't understand them theoretically, um, will teach us, yeah, a lot. Um, Thank you. Yeah, also please uh, feel free now to ask the questions about the first talk, second talks I suggested. Can I, can I ask a question, Shanhan, about your talk? So um, you, you you found this um, this you discussed the celestial radio limit and analyticity in in this yes uh, celestial spin. Uh, in terms of original CFT, uh, what kind of analyticity it it is? So because I guess people observe experimentally that if you take say perturbative computations, there is analyticity in spin. Now we understand that there is analyticity in this little n variable, which controls, you know, twist of different. Uh, is it related to that or not? Um, right. Um, I'm I'm not sure. So, but because um in the collinear e you see this meaning of transfer spin. Well, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure, but maybe one comment is just that. Uh, well, as you know, in the variable p, the this um so different higher transfer term, sorry, different higher transfer spin terms depends on you know radio trajectory evaluated at different value of j. So in some sense, this behavior in Transfer spin sort of depends on the behavior along this radio trajectory. So maybe so, yeah. yeah. So this is something. Maybe, the, yeah, sorry, sorry. Or sorry. Maybe I can also comment on yes. Yeah, so, so I think what you're so, so for these like leading twist two operators, when you compute their anomalous dimensions just perturbatively, they're just like gamma functions or their friends in J. And so people before had just um, analytically continued them everywhere. Um, and kind of understood that. So this transverse spin is, is something very different because it's um, it's a higher twist object. So essentially to go to higher, in perturbation theory, um, you're going to higher and higher and higher twists. And so it's something um, which from the QCD perspective is kind of quite remarkable because it's the coefficients of these higher and higher twist operators which are almost not at all understood and they just fall into these nice, um, whether it's analytic in J. And so I think it's something completely different, which um, I know of no, um, even on the perturbative side, no analog for what that is. So it's really something that has not been um, or could not be accessed at all before. And so it's something, yeah, much more um, um, kind of magical, at least from the perturbative side. Um, Yeah, I guess it's it's strong coupling because uh, it's strong coupling this higher twist guys that is just labeled by this little n, which is uh, like O box to the n dj O, and then many perturbative computations people just saw that the dependence on n is very simple and you can continue, but I don't think there was any, any explanation for that. So it's okay. Anyhow, yeah. it's it's interesting to understand. It. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, but particularly like these ones in both QCD and n equals four the higher twist operators are quite complicated. And so this is somehow, yeah, yeah. I mean, that their OP data or essentially to my knowledge, nothing is known about them. And so it's a much more um, like these ones as a function of J were computed in like the seventies yeah, yeah. or something. And whereas this is something quite um, different and would be, yeah, definitely interesting to understand more. Uh, Any other questions? Okay, well, um, if uh, there are no other questions, I 
So just we thank uh, Sean Han and Ian again for this amazing presentation. And uh, I guess we'll see see each other next next week. I don't know when the next bootstrap seminar. So thank you guys and uh, thanks everyone. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you. Yeah, bye. bye.